Information warfare, disinformation, and propaganda have persisted since the beginning of recorded history and remain alive, alive and well in the present day. Our next talk will address the challenges surrounding information warfare management. We present Daniel Nowak, Rolf Schoenberg, and Alexander Urbelis with iWar and Information Warfare, the next phase of internet motility, manipulation inherent to the internet's DNA. Hello. Today's talk is titled iWar and Information Warfare, the next phase of internet motility, manipulation inherent to the internet's DNA. Our agenda will be split into three separate segments. I, Daniel Nowak, will do the history and period segment. Rolf Schoenberg will deliver the technical summary and Alex Urbelis will deliver the ongoing operations segment. A brief intro to your speakers is as follows. I, Daniel Nowak, have been doing telco and cyber stuff since the mid-90s. I've been involved in Coming to Hope since the later 90s. Roel Schoenberg has been involved in the scene and the culture since the mid to late 90s as well, as most of his time was spent for reverse engineering, spending time tracking actors, as well as large-scale malware campaigns across a variety of domains. Alex Urbelis is a partner at Blackstone Law Group. He's been involved in both Hope as well as the scene going back 25 years. He's also a frequent contributor to a number of online publications. Now that we're done with the simple stuff, let's get to the more complicated pieces. An introduction to our rules of engagement. We have to accept the fact that propaganda and disinformation are not inherently evil. Uh, they, we might not like them, we might not like their effects, but they simply are tools in order to accomplish something. Everything is dual use in our space. And if anyone wants to doubt that, just look at crypto. Consider the crypto wars, the clipper chip of the early 90s. Eh, heck, this whole community was busy fighting this war almost 30 years ago. And interestingly enough, it's happening to us again, right? The calls for backdooring all crypto technology, they're resounding very, very strongly at present. Um, when we're discussing history, there can be no third rails. For those who are not familiar with what a third rail is, it is the third rail in a train line that's electrified. You touch it, you're effectively fried. We cannot do that when we're discussing these topics of propaganda, disinformation. Uh, anything in that nature needs to be considered objectively and from a couple steps back. We need to review history and learn from it rather than just try to erase it and pretend it didn't happen. Uh, in terms of history, one of the first things we always cover is a definition of what the 18th century means. So 18th century equals 1700s. The 20th century means 1900s. Next, uh, this is not really a history of propaganda dis or disinformation. It's simply a, pri a primer. As Alex called it, it's a transistorized version of history. We're compressing 4,500 years of content and attempting to make analogs and uh, analyze what the history has provided us in the current space we live in. When engaging in historical discourse, one of the main points I like to make when talking about history is explaining that history is his story. It is the tale of the victors. It is the tale of those who have vanquished others in some form of combat, be it physical warfare or economic warfare. Therefore, the tale is theirs. And therefore, the narrative and the storyline reflects the, the perspectives they want to share with the world. Let's talk ancient history. For some, ancient history might be 100 years ago. For others, well, let's, let's step back and for the purpose of this discussion and go to the 25th century BCE, around 4,500 years ago, to the advent of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire operated in a region that was known as modern-day Iraq, and it lasted from 25, 20, 2,500 BCE until 612, 609, somewhere in that window where it collapsed. And then within a couple hundred years, their primary city, Nineveh, was effectively ground to dust and reabsorbed by the desert. Complete disillusion of a nation state that had lasted for 1,500 years. Now, if anyone here has gone to a bookstore, if, if you can find a bookstore at this point, everything's online, right? But if you can go to an actual bookstore, go to the history section and take a look around. What you will see is a ridiculous amount of texts wrapped around war, different wars across different periods, across all of written history of mankind. Apparently that's what gets documented and historians tend to like this. So take a look at the bottom left-hand side of the screen if you would, take note of the archers in combat, and then look on the right-hand side of the screen, take note of the men impaled on skewers. Assyrians went to war a lot and they like to impale people a lot. This is simply what they did and they documented it copiously. The question you might ask is why? Well, perhaps they were trying to share a specific narrative with their adversaries across time that expressed how brutal they were and perhaps prevented them from having to engage in such excess brutality if those they were coming for already knew what was going to happen to them. So while this is occurring in the Middle East, 
Let's flip to the other side of the world in the Near East, in the Middle Kingdom, to the 6th century BCE with Sun Tzu. Yet another uh, tactician and strategist documenting what deception is for, right? When you look at and consider these stone tablets from the Assyrians, that is part of a, a deception plan, a propaganda plan. And according to Sun Tzu, all warfare is based on deception. Time to flash forward 2,000 years to the Renaissance in the 15th century. That's roughly mid-1400s, at least in this case, in the creation of the Gutenberg Press. I'd hope there have been a number of discussions regarding the Gutenberg Press, just simply the way it fundamentally changed our society. Well, let's consider what it did in terms of the, uh, communicating for the mass culture. So the first publications that were called newspapers appeared in Strasbourg in Germany around 1609. Uh, the printing press also enabled the mass printing of leaflets, political leaflets, opinions, religious leaflets, right? Various types of propaganda pieces. And you have to remember the context and the time in this window. This is the time of the Reformation. This is Martin Luther and the Roman Catholic Church and a great schism, an argument, a fight between two different systems of thought now able to reach the masses. As many say, uh, the Gutenberg Press was part of the democratization of technology. It indeed was, and it certainly enabled the large-scale communication patterns to change because, once again, the, the communications were written in the local languages. Another interesting topic to discuss is the printing of the King James Bible. The KJV is an interesting political animal. To go into a discourse on it now it would be foolhardy. It's, there's simply too much to it. All that's worthy of note is that there were extreme politics behind the creation of this Bible, and the expression of it and the rapid printing of it enabled the dissemination of a different philosophy of thought that diverged from the Geneva Bible, um, different concepts regarding the divine right of kings, and simply uh, an administrative control mechanism pushed out to the people. Then we flash forward to the 19th century at the heart of the Industrial Revolution. The second half of the 19th century had three core technologies developed that fundamentally altered how humans communicate. Telegrams, telephone, and radio. The first transatlantic telegram happened in 1858. This enabled immediately the news cycle to change. Information that would have taken weeks to months to flow from the European continent made it to the United States within minutes and then was usually turned into newspaper material shortly thereafter. The news cycle is now global. People can hear each other's voices due to the early telephone technologies developed city to city and eventually across the pond as well. And towards the very, very tail end of the 19th century, the Marconi's development of the radio brought us into a new wireless era. Three new mediums of communication, all enabling different types of information to flow from disinformation to propaganda, for example, to war propaganda. On the left-hand corner, we have an image of Remember the Main. Uh, the statement at the time was Remember the Main to Hell with Spain, and it was blasted across all media outlets in, support, in American support of the Spanish-American War. And we enter the 20th century, where the confluence of technologies in warring nation-states creates a quickening, where more occurs in several months than historically would have happened in decades. On the right-hand side, there's a gentleman in a dapper suit with a very, very slick mustache. That is Edward Bernays, nephew of Sigmund Freud. He is the creator of the All-American Breakfast, done on behalf of the pork producers of America at the time. Uh, just beneath him, there's a little dancing lady. She looks very happy. She has some lucky strikes. That was another project of Bernays' PR firm. Uh, the concept was smoking those particular brand of cigarettes, whomever he was uh, representing, enabled freedom and liberty for the women from their previous lives. This gentleman also was the writer of the book Propaganda, which is a fusion of sociological analysis, psychological manipulation techniques, all towards achieving a better and more effective system of public communication. To the left of the Bernays image is the image of a very dour looking man named Joseph Goebbels. Joseph Goebbels was the Reich Minister of Propaganda of the NSDAP, otherwise known as the Nazi Party. Goebbels had a concept of total war that fused technology and media, understanding everything was fair game when it comes to war. So much so that when Germany did the 1936 Olympics, it was a showcase of superior technology. It was also the first broadcast television Olympics that had been done. He also did cinema. They created a number of films uh, supporting the NSDAP's propaganda. 
And with the second half of the 20th century, where more of us uh, are aware of what transpired, we now have a 24-hour news cycle thanks to all these global communication techniques and then the development of ARPANET as well as the greater internet. Globalization shared uh, both technology as well as communication methods and culture around the world. There's nowhere on the planet you cannot go that has Coca-Cola. There may be no running water, but somehow there will be Coca-Cola. The crux of this discussion is that with the news cycle changing so fast, the tempo of people's uptake of information changed. So now we have print media, we have online media, which is certainly faster to consume, whereas the, the print media can only be done once or twice a day. New media was being printed regularly on a 24-hour basis. It's 2020, and we have an entire generation of individuals who are born and raised on the internet. The way they consume information is different from prior generations. Most of their information is flows not from CNN or traditional mainstream media sources, but it comes from Facebook, it comes from Twitter, it comes through the social media pipeline. Knowing the history of, long history of war and the way information needs to be manipulated and deception is a core component of facilitating the objectives of various nation states or interested parties, a number of uh, domains of expertise ha have come around to participate in this type of information manipulation. So we have information operations teams, we have psychological operations teams. The Eastern European framework looked at the idea as dis disinformatia. And from the Middle Kingdom and the CCP, we have something that we call unrestricted warfare, more accurately translated as unlimited warfare. Within the schema of unlimited warfare, anything goes. Let's couple that and all these facts with the understanding that our cyber and technical information systems are inherently faulty and based upon trust. And if you understand how to manipulate those trust relationships between all the different endpoints, network components, and application layers of our infrastructure, it's relatively easy to inject information into them, much less just hacking them, which is obviously a simple and very straightforward process. But we're talking about injecting information into the stream to change people's perceptions and reshape their understanding of the world around them. With all that being said, let's take into context the advent of hack and leak operations. The various strategic leaks we've seen in the last five years at the national level, or even at looking at the financial firms. We can even consider some of these as being sabotage and exfil for cover for action. I'd argue it's even possible to consider them cultural sabotage to the point that we now, as a culture, support certain types of leaking and certain types of activity, even though it may not even be in our best interest. It might be in the interest of others who are actually funding and supporting those activities. This new medium of communication enables a whole new level of mass manipulation, where everyone is able to get their five seconds of Andy Warhol fame, but at what cost? The 21st century has brought us a variety of postmodern operations. An example of this might be the colored revolutions, where you can overthrow a nation without raising the barrel of a gun. These forms of revolution are a dedicated study in and of themselves, but for the purpose of this discussion, let's say that a color revolution is a form of nonviolent power shift in a nation that leverages the outside manipulation of a protesting populace in conjunction with political, economic, or other non-military measures. This means all actions are covert and therefore do not appear to be overt acts of war. This is not first, second, or third generation warfare, where it's clear who the opponent is. It is covert warfare that leverages false flags, media manipulation, social media uprisings, and sock puppets in order to facilitate the outside interests objectives. Next, I'd like to draw your attention to the smoking man at the right side of the screen. This is Vladislav Surkov, a power broker within the Russian political superstructure. His specialty is fusing the following domains, ideology, media, political parties, religion, modernization, innovation, foreign relations, and modern art, tying it all together into one bundle of joy. Who else have we discussed who leveraged art, media, politics, and religion to advance the interests of their political party? Goebbels. Both men express a keen grasp of what is required to mobilize a population. Consider this philosophy in terms of certain hack and leak operations, perhaps some ransomware operations, and then consider the methodologies employed during a number of Russian direct action campaigns from 2007 through this day. Think Estonia, Georgia, Ukraine. Going forward, please keep in mind the aphorism Nothing is true and everything is possible, particularly in this postmodern age. Lastly, the most esoteric topic of all, The Mind Has No Firewall, an article written by Timothy Thomas in Parameters Magazine, spring of 1998. The human body and mind consist of a variety of sensors that are there in order to give us a perspective on the world around us. 
We have data processing units in order to take the input and create an intelligible output. Garbage in, garbage out, like any type of compute system. So what happens when an attacker uses disinformation to create a cognitive dissonance in the mind of a target? Or perhaps uses information overload techniques in order to confuse, degrade, or deny the signals being received by the target? This is well within scope of modern day information operations, as well as disinformatio or unrestricted warfare campaigns. So to recap, Segment one, we need to remember agendas drive disinformation and propaganda. Nations, corporations, even personal interests of individuals drive their agendas. Every entity is driven to facilitate its own success. And we need to understand and be able to disentangle the what, the where's and the why's of all these things. In order to understand those pieces, we really understand need to understand who benefits and be able to track the money. If we can't understand who funds what and what activities are stemming from where, in an emotion-free manner, we're fairly lost in trying to disambiguate all the disinformation campaigns that are going to be run against us through the rest of this 21st century. The intersection of tech and politics are where things are super interesting. The challenge we face in this area as technologists is that Tech people tend to like the bits and the bytes, the binary components. Uh, everyone wants to focus on the tech, whereas the reality is tech is using is being manipulated through geopolitical means. So that means we, as SMEs, we need to put in the time to become geopolitical experts, the 10,000 or so hours that it takes to get generalized expertise in a specific area. This also means single dimensional thinking is fruitless to a degree. For specializations, that's one thing, but for solving these types of bigger picture problems, we need cross domain experts who can fuse their technical knowledge with geopolitical or biotechnical components, put them together and understand what the problem is that they're trying to solve and who's actually generating the problem in the first place. There's nothing new under the sun. However, the, we are living in the more malleable time than any generation before us. Every day we're experiencing people trying to rewrite history, which th that's an interesting thing to happen. The Syrians had stone tablets to carve their history. Our history is written on spinning disks, which fade over time. So I earlier said, there's nothing new under the sun. There's just new modalities to exploit. And we can be assured that this global world of adversaries will take advantage of each and every one. Hey everyone, before getting into this segment, I want to quickly touch on the differences between IWAR, a term that we don't see used very often these days, and information warfare or information operations. IWAR is about cyber-enabled warfare. Um, think of a DDoS attack. It's you're, you're, the attackers trying to degrade access to a particular capability. Uh, we've seen this in conflict in Estonia in 2007, Georgia in 2008, uh, in 2020, very valid IWAR targets would be um, cellular networks or content delivery networks. Meanwhile, information operations are about manipulating information that's intended for human and or machine consumption. Uh, we also see these days that uh, IO, the term IO gets conflated with disinformation or fake news. But we ha really have to keep in mind that disinformation, fake news, psychological operations are really just a subset of information warfare. And we see that a lot of this information warfare is made easy by the fact that the internet is an inherently open and brittle network. We are still running on ancient protocols like BGP and DNS that really weren't designed for authentication or verification purposes. And as a result of that, we see that the offensive teams really have a leg up on the defensive teams. Not only does the internet run on old protocols and old, old systems, uh, we have added to this complexity by introducing cloud and mobile. And all these ecosystems that are now constantly consuming and producing information. All these different uh, vendors and services as well are constantly collecting information for security purposes, analytics, and most certainly advertising purposes. Um, on the more human side, we have the issue that, uh, especially as it relates to mobile, we have that constant dopamine uh, kick coming in. We always want to check the latest news, the latest emails, the 
the latest um, stuff that's happening on social media. The fear of missing out is real and people or companies are exploiting that. In addition to all of that good stuff, right, we have seen new players enter the game. Uh, since, certainly since the last five years or so, we started talking about uh, the so-called influence operator, operator, and we can find those everywhere these days. And it's safe to assume that just about every country on the planet has influence operators, working for the government, but also working in the commercial sector. So really, we, we should see this as a form of persistent engagement um, wherever we go, which is kind of mind-boggling if you take a, a moment to think about it. And these influence operators aren't just trying to influence uh, 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 our, our conversations that are overtly political, right? They want to uh, influence on any type of level. Um, think back to those uh, FCC net neutrality uh, comments that were uh, mostly uh, inauthentic or fake, whatever you want to call them. Right? That wasn't the beginning, that wasn't the end, that was daily business. Right? We really have to think about these problems in a little broader terms other than you know fake accounts on social media. And that really brings me to also to the concept of you know these influence operators poisoning data sets. In a way, our social media conversations are just another data set. So if the social, if these influence operators can influence those types of data sets, they can also do to others. That's really something very important to keep in mind. When we think about these social networks, we have to consider if they're closed or open. Open networks are great. They allow us to talk to anyone on the planet in real time. Um, and that is something that influence operators are now exploiting, right? And as a, a counter to that, we're now seeing that uh, push to kind of try and turn these open networks into a safe space, but that's inherently impossible. Right? Our, what we would end up with is an approximation of the Chinese internet, which I don't think anybody actually wants. It's not anyone who has uh, our best interest at heart. And kind of thinking about how these influence operators are working, and there's uh, sort of four different uh, levels or tiers that you can kind of think about. If you think about those fake personas that everybody now knows about, those hack and leak operations that um, we, we have seen in the guise of Guccifer and some other personas. Um, but it gets more interesting when we start thinking about poisoning open data sets, because at that point you have legitimate, well-intentioned people pu uh, publishing information uh, that is tainted without their knowledge. So that, that's something that, that is a lot more of value on a strategic side for the influence operators uh, versus the first two uh, categories. And the fourth category, right, when we think about back about when we think back to 2016, there was a lot of talk about uh, the Internet Research Agency operating out of St. Petersburg with their fake personas, uh, doing a lot of stuff on social networks. There wasn't that much talk, however, about how foreign intelligence agencies were trying to uh, manipulate newsrooms directly into uh, writing certain narratives. Right? That has for the most part, not been explored to the uh, extent that it should have been. And that's, at least in 2020, that is still the prime goal. If you can get a well-established, reputable reporter to echo your sentiments, then the influence operator has really done their job. Kind of uh, continuing on about uh, on that topic, right, most of uh, that conversation that we have in public about disinformation of, of fake news still focus on uh, that more tactical, short-term agitation propaganda. We're not really talking about longer-term narratives that span years or decades even. Right? A lot of stuff that we see on the internet today originated as something entirely different uh, 20 or 30 years ago, and that's something we need to keep in mind. We need to get more historians involved in how we're dealing with some of these problems. Moreover, as I mentioned earlier, 
uh, we're seeing more and more uh, information or, or work out there that's strictly based on OSINT. When we consider the reality that influence operators are poisoning these data sets, we kind of have to reconsider uh, the confidence level we, we can attribute to um, uh, research that's strictly derived from OSINT and or big data. Right? Again, this is something that can be manipulated, certainly when you know what to look for and when you know what the researchers are looking for. Moreover, um, we're currently seeing kind of a push where certain uh, topics are becoming uh, off limits. And that really doesn't help us either, certainly not um, in the long run. Um, by making topics off limits, we're just making them the domain or exclusive domain of intelligence agencies and multinational uh, corporations. I, I don't think I have to explain why that is not in our best interest. In addition to that, right, when we think, when we see uh, lots of reports out there, or a fair amount of reports out there, of reporters and other influencers getting harassed on social media, on uh, email, right, it boggles my mind that it's the second half of 2020 and we still haven't had a public conversation on how authentic these harassments actually are. Right? Maybe uh, the narrative around some of these events needs to change. Moving on to the uh, more malware side of things uh, on the internet warfare side, right? Uh, NotPetya was an attack launched a little over three years ago uh, by Russian intelligence against uh, Ukraine and uh, a lot of companies doing business in or with Ukraine. And this particular uh, sabotage attack that the White House has called the most destructive cyber attack to date uh, was mimicking as a piece of ransomware. But in reality, it was uh, a so-called wiper malware that would just delete all data off of the machine. It would spread across networks. Uh, as a result, life in Ukraine basically stopped. Um, the Western logistics supply chain was crippled for a prolonged period of time. There were major, major effects. What's interesting is that the uh, not Petra orchestrators and planners uh, empl employed deception on many different layers, kind of exploiting um, subject matter experts' biases. And right? so you really had to get a, a team together for, that had expertise in at least uh, half a dozen different uh, areas to really get a full picture of what Not Petra was all about. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, just you know, plug my own HOPE 2018 talk uh, in case you, you have an extra interest in this particular example. As I mentioned, Not, not Petya kind of was a, a blueprint, uh, just like Stuxnet was a, a blueprint for many follow-on uh, operations. Um, what we see uh, in 2020 is uh, lots and lots of ransomware. And since uh, 2019, we've seen an increase in ransomware operations that also involve a data exfiltration component. Uh, when we take a step back and think about the implications thereof, that means that ransomware is now cover for action for sabotage, it makes a great cover for action for uh, espionage, as well as making a potential cover for um, influence operations. We have already seen uh, a ransomware actor or two trying to generate uh, press cycles. Right? That, that's it's certainly a very interesting uh, development. And with uh, most of these uh, ransomware groups working with an affiliate uh, model, it's very hard to tell who is actually conducting the operations. Is that somebody who is unemployed because of COVID or is that a foreign intelligence team? So with all these wonderful uh, problems, what about mitigations? Well, mitigations aren't very easy, certainly not when it comes to this type of scale. But we do have to think about our information supply chain. Right? Where does our information come from? What kind of sources and methods were used? And what are we doing with that uh, information? How, you know, are we valuing it accordingly and appropriately? Um, certainly, there, there are things we, we can do to make the internet a little bit more resilient. 
But on the, the grand uh, scheme of things, right, we're going to have lots of conflicts of interest. So maybe what we end up uh, doing is uh, keeping the current internet as is, more or less, and creating a separate internet where we do our more attributable work, where, where it's not going to be possible for influence operators just to pretend to be somebody else. Um, uh, again, we need to, that, that would require a lot of uh, considerations. And again, we wouldn't want to uh, give up our freedoms that we have today. That uh, should absolutely not be up for discussion. We do not want uh, uh, to copy in any way, shape, or form the Chinese internet. That brings me to uh, my last slide. Um, just before handing it over to Alex, because he's going to talk about uh, COVID a bunch. Uh, something to consider here is um, the COVID crisis really kind of showcased how different countries and other elements conduct, conduct their, uh, their messaging. And I haven't seen any public research on this, but this is really a great research area that I would love to see some uh, public work on. Good afternoon, everybody. Alex Rebellis here. Uh, many of you know me, co-host of Off the Hook, lawyer, hacker, CISO, all that fun stuff. I want to jump right into this since I know we did some, some brief intros at the outset of this presentation. And picking up where Roll had left off with respect to technical manipulation and the coronavirus. Well, the situation that we're in is quite a morass. And one way to look at this is you know, the DNS is where all of this comes to a head. Before delving right into the DNS data, I want to take a rather long step back to the internet of the mid-90s that some of us may and some of us may not remember. Uh, and that is where we first see the germ of the problems that we're facing today. Jumping back to 1995, we see what Mercedes-Benz looked like way back then. This was a much simpler time before misinformation was a pervasive problem, before the Cambridge Analytica fiasco demonstrated that Facebook was putting our PII into the hands of any idiot who created a quiz. Um, but what we have on the right-hand side is very interesting as well. The WWF in 2000 was the first organization to file a UDRP. That was to reclaim a domain name. It stands for Uniform Domain Name resolution policy. It's an enforcement mechanism used essentially for brand protection. Uh, and it had fallen out of disfavor. It, 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 DNS enforcement has become a, really an issue of a whack-a-mole. And that had created this problem of uh, DNS enforcement being both a legal issue with security implications and a security issue with legal implications, meaning it led to a rift of responsibility in many organizations whereby the DNS was left unattended and weeds started to grow. We wanted to give you an example of an organization that is the target of a good amount of malicious activity, but is in fact uh, a bit asleep at the switch. So this is what uh, the Trump organization uh, looks like from the perspective of the DNS. As you can see, almost every single permutation of trump.com is, is registered by some actor within or without the United States. The registrars are all over the place. The geolocations are all over the place. Um, and there's little to no enforcement of DNS. This actually is a, a marked improvement, however, from two years ago when we presented at Hope uh, along similar lines. A really quick plug for my Circle of Hope 2018 talk entitled Cyber Squatting on the Trump Campaign. This was about misinformation activities directed towards the Trump campaign in the DNS. Out of the 60,000 or so domains about Trump that existed in 2016, the campaign, the Trump campaign, identified and neutralized these misinformation activities before they were able to launch. Quite an interesting talk. I encourage you all to go check it out. Getting right back to the issue of the coronavirus and COVID-19 in the DNS, what we saw at the end of February when we started monitoring for new domain registrations was frankly amazing. To put this in perspective, global sporting events you know, things like the World Cup, maybe they'll get 10 to 20 domain name registrations per day. And it relates to Jersey streaming tickets, et cetera. You investigate everything. That's quite a lot of activity. In February, we started seeing over 200 registrations per day. Then in March, it jumped up to 400, 500, 600. At its peak, 
we saw over 3,500 domain registrations on a daily basis. I mean, it was absolutely incredible. Over 100,000 coronavirus-related domains since February. Um, with respect to COVID-19, over 39,000 COVID-20 domains are popping up now. And the strange hope, I guess, that there's a permutation and, and that domain property becomes valuable. Uh, over 700 of those. So this is a, a pretty massive amount of activity in the DNS, the likes of which I have never seen before. This graph that you see here is a visual representation of the registrations by date with respect to specifically coronavirus domain names. This doesn't relate to COVID-19 registrations. However, that pattern of domain registrations is very, very similar, almost an exact match of, of this particular pattern. But what you see is that it started out quite strong. This uh, begins at the end of February, early March, goes up to around 3,500 per day, has a really high peak at the end of March, and then begins to taper down. What we're seeing right now, though, is still a lot of activity, usually between 30 to 60 domain names with respect to the coronavirus every single day. Putting that into perspective, again, massive well, global sporting events, usually maybe 10 a day. Uh, and at the height of blockchain activity a couple of years ago, we would see maybe 30, 40, 50 domains. So uh, six months out uh, of when the coronavirus left China and began to run rampant through the world, this is still a huge amount of activity we're seeing in the DNS uh, and activity that we saw in March and April. Well, never seen anything like that before in my life. And a lot of the activity that we saw with regard to the coronavirus didn't specifically relate to coronavirus or COVID-19 domains, some of them related to the World Health Organization. Just like this, you have who.int, which is the restricted top-level domain in which the World Health Organization has its domain uh, on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, a domain that we detected on the 7th of July, just three weeks ago, who-info.site, obviously an exact replica. Uh, this is intel that we had shared previously with the World Health Organization. This isn't news to them. Um, but with this information, uh, this domain was able to be taken down quite quickly. We think it related to a, um, a scam with regard to the donations button on the right-hand side, but obviously could be used for any number of purposes, including misinformation, as well as outright fraud. And this leads us to asking additional questions about, really, who is the who? And on that note, on the left-hand side here, we have the actual who is information for the who, uh, for who.int, that is. Uh, and on the right-hand side, we have a domain that we had picked up, again, uh, just under three weeks ago this time. It looks like who-int.org. However, when you look at the who is information, it's obvious that that is actually a lowercase l. The domain itself is who lnt. Org. This was obviously trying to create some kind of visual similarity between who.int, that restricted .ntld for IGOs, intergovernmental organizations, and the domain on the right, who-lnt.org. A lot of this stuff, uh, obviously, very ripe for misinformation and, and kind of difficult to pick up unless you're specifically looking for this type of, of activity in the DNS. And again, this is information that we had previously shared with Flavio and the WHO, and we encourage you to check out his keynote coming up very soon as well. What we've been talking about so far is the surface level of the domain name system of the DNS. Uh, what is below the surface are subdomains, and this is arguably much more concerning because subdomains are unregulated, meaning anybody can create any subdomain on, any on top of any domain at any time. Because of this, they're much more difficult to track and much more difficult to detect. Unlike domains that are subject to dispute resolution procedures like the UDRP that we saw with the WWF, there's nothing specifically geared towards subdomains. And because of this, we are seeing a lot of sophisticated misinformation activity and sophisticated information security threats migrating over to the subdomain space. We're going to show you some pretty interesting examples of that right now. A really great example of how Subdomains can be used for malicious activity is this particular domain name, gov-survey.com. This relates to a group of threat actors that we've been tracking for quite a while. And you see that the subdomains, the bits to the left of the domain uh, that they created were very interesting and, and obviously highly malicious in that in June of 2018, 
just ahead of the midterm elections, we see this domain, gov-survey.org, with a subdomain on top of it, Florida Votes. That obviously makes it look like FloridaVotes.gov. It looks like an official .gov. We also see the replication of news.treasury.gov, a great domain name for misinformation with respect to the United States Treasury. We also see the replication of ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement.gov, as well as ICE.DHS.gov. So this is a great example of how subdomains can be used very maliciously to impersonate .gov sites, uh, as well as to push out misinformation. It should therefore come as no surprise that with respect to coronavirus and COVID-19 related subdomains, these are massively out of control and running wild. They're all over the place. Some of them are pushing out downloads. Some of them are just pushing out misinformation. It's become a big problem because of the very fact that subdomains are completely unregulated and can be created by anybody at any time on top of whatever domain they please, whether it's a domain that may have been compromised or a domain that perhaps was newly registered. Uh, it's a space rife for misinformation, as you can see. Misinformation has, in fact, become a compliance issue now, uh, quite recently. Uh, like somebody waking up from a, a frat party, looking in the mirror and realizing they have no eyebrows. Uh, Congress has very recently come to the realization that there is a, a major problem now arising from coronavirus misinformation. This is, of course, uh, many months after coronavirus-related misinformation had been identified by people in our community as a major problem. So they, they being Congress, wrote a letter to the major online platforms and asked for monthly updates about what they're doing to combat misinformation. Uh, all of the domains that you are seeing on this slide right now uh, relate to coronavirus-related uh, information in Facebook properties. Facebook, uh, Instagram, WhatsApp, the IG-domains obviously refer to Instagram. Um, and having scoured the DNS for these particular domains that were targeting Facebook properties, we found something that we think uh, all of you will find rather interesting. One of the things that jumped out with respect to the domains that we had investigated uh, concerning Facebook properties, WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook itself, uh, and the coronavirus was that there, was, there were very distinct patterns of domains, all of which related to coronavirus information, your COVID-19 related information, all of these domains, all registered in .net, .org, and .com that could be used for misinformation purposes. And when, when we began to enrich that data using our DNS, our in-house uh, DNS Intel platform, uh, what jumped out was very fascinating, is that all of these domains, or rather the vast majority of these domains, all are associated with Registrar L SEC LLC. That's actually a Facebook registrar that they use to make preemptive domain name registrations. So all of these domain name registrations that could be used for coronavirus-related misinformation campaigns were actually preemptively registered by Facebook. It's quite interesting. I mean, this is, this is a step that Facebook probably has not been taking for a while, and I don't think that this was, has been publicly announced or was publicly known. So if I were compliance counsel for Facebook, this is something I would definitely put into my responsive letter to Congress. And quite honestly, you have to give credit when credit is due. Making these preemptive domain name registrations is a proactive measure that's going to make some kind of measurable difference. However, there are nearly an infinite variety of ways that, that one could register a domain related to a Facebook property and the coronavirus. So monitoring the DNS for such activity is absolutely critical. I mean, not to mention, again, that domain names themselves are the tip of the iceberg. Preemptive registrations like this do nothing actually to combat the problem of subdomains, but at least it's doing something. And I think, you know, we got to give Facebook some credit, some props for, for doing the right thing and, and taking steps to counter potential misinformation campaigns. And speaking of subdomains, this gets us back to an issue to which we had alluded earlier. Using our DNS intelligence platform, we had detected a live state-sponsored and very sophisticated attack on the World Health Organization in the middle of March. This was an attack that had existed entirely in the subdomain space. The underlying domain had nothing to do with the WHO. I actually uh, alluded more to uh, Active Directory itself. 
it was also used to target the UN as well as the Swiss-based ISP that same day. Uh, it was a smart, slick, very sophisticated attack, ultimately unsuccessful. We're not giving away the specific domain at issue here. That is still uh, a highly valued threat intelligence. But do reach out, Alex at Blackstone-Law.com or A or Bellis on Twitter if you want to follow up and ask some questions about that intel. If you're a threat researcher, a threat hunter, uh, or just intellectually curious, we uh, would be happy to share additional TTPs with you. Pulling together some of the various threads about which we've spoken during this presentation, one that should be jumping out is that the DNS and the internet itself are quite fluid to the extent that misinformation and manipulation can occur quite easily. This is all the more true when there is zero enforcement with respect to terms like the coronavirus and COVID-19. Uh, DNS activity is massive, but it can yield actionable and critical data, and DNS-based Misinformation campaigns can be identified and can be neutralized. Unfortunately, misinformation is becoming a compliance issue. If, you, if your misinformation detection campaigns fail, you're probably going to have to be answering to some lawyers at some point soon. This has been a lot of fun. We hope you guys have enjoyed it. Uh, we look forward to your questions. Hopefully we can answer them. Please do stay in touch. Signing off. This is I War and Information Warfare with uh, Daniel Nowak, Raul Schoenberg, and Alexander Urbelis. Um, we'd like to quickly invite uh, audience Q&A. We have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, so we'll get right into this. Uh, a member of the audience asks, how do you get your feed of new domain name registrations? Uh, I can take that one, guys. Um, that's based off of our we're own bespoke in-house DNS intelligence platform that we've created within Blackstone Law Group. Uh, I actually coded every single line of our Intel platform. And what we do is a lot different from ordinary brand protection in the DNS. We're looking for early stage indicators of malicious activity, uh, looking across all CCTLDs, country code top level domains, as well as the generic top level domains like .com, .org, .fish, .horse these days, uh, and looking not just for matches and strings, but indicia of malicious activity. So uh, we'd be happy to speak more about that with you guys directly. Uh, you guys and girls directly offline again uh, alex at blackstone-law.com and uh, just as we wrap it up uh, where where can people i guess uh, blackstonelaw.com would be where people should go to find uh, more info on what you're doing yeah there's uh, absolutely that's definitely a source uh, a urbellis on twitter uh as well as dan and roll I uh, know uh roll dan i don't believe is on twitter these days right are you i, I can't tell or just lurking Lurking, it exists, but I don't do anything with it. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, what other questions do we have? Do we have a couple minutes that we can? Uh, we, we've got about a minute. Uh, if uh, someone asks, uh, is regulation of DNS records something worthwhile to look into from a legal perspective? Uh, yeah, I mean, in an ideal world, that would be nice. I mean, the problem with, you know, looking at this from a legal perspective is that if we're going to try to create a legal mechanism to, to uh, enforce against these particular type of activities that require the legal process is all about due process. Due process requires time and an opportunity to be heard by both sides. That's not necessarily the type of system that's best at combating uh, very fast moving threats in, in the domain name system. So the legal process I think could be used for pernicious and uh, uh, perniciously malicious actors of, of the, the, the kind that keep coming back, the APTs. But you know, we need better integrity in the DNS. We need better uh, enforcement and better identification of, of threat actor activity in the first instance. And I think that's what we do. And uh, someone asks, with every domain registrar offering privacy to hide the actual owner of the domain, what's the point of the public who is database since it shows much but not actually who is? And well, uh, who has access to the actual owner info? That's, you know, well, the registrars and the registry would have the, the owner info. However, even though most of the stuff is masked or most of the stuff is nonsensical or it's GDPR masked, there are still certain bits of information that you can tie various actors and activities together with, including uh, information like the registration time of the domain, the expiration date of the domain, looking across different registrations and disparate registrations, you can tie malicious activity together by looking at that those specific entries in the who is data so there still is relevance to it there's still relevance to a lot of the dns data if you know how to pivot on okay uh alex daniel and roll thank you very much for joining us today
Thank you, guys. Always a pleasure.